In this video, I'm going to describe what services-oriented architecture is and give a brief history as well. I want to start off with a question that I received once after the first day of class in undergrad. I had a student come up to me after class and he said, what's big? And I, keep in mind, this is after I had a good three-hour lecture after an eight-hour workday, so I was kind of in a hurry to get home and wasn't really sure what he was asking. So I said, what do you mean, what's big? And after a bit of back and forth, he finally said, what can I do in this field to make a lot of money? And I said, oh, okay, 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 I gotcha, I gotcha. And I said, well, integration's big. And he said, what's integration? And I said, well, uh, probably easiest to explain through an example. I just booked a trip on Expedia, and the trip included a flight on Delta. And so as soon as I hit book, I went over to Delta, I logged in with my frequent flyer number, and because I was, at the time, had frequent flyer status, I was able to choose a better seat on the airplane. And all of this happened just moments after I booked my flight through Expedia, which is a different company. So I explained this to the student, and he paused for a second, and he said, well, hasn't it always worked that way? And I said, no, 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 that is a massive achievement. The ability to have different systems talking to each other between companies or among companies, not to mention within a company, is something that has unlocked a whole lot of value. And really, it's something that we've had for a while, but really, really, we've seen an explosion of it in the last 10 years or so. So with that, what is services-oriented architecture? Well, a collection of services are things that can do work. We want to have communication between the services, and we want them to be loosely coupled, so if one changes, it doesn't necessarily impact another service. When we're thinking about services, we're oftentimes thinking about organizations that have some data to provide. And if we look historically, what was the first iteration of providing some kind of data? It parallels the history of the written word. The first evidence of written letters or numbers whatsoever is an accounting ledger from many, many years ago. Similarly, mainframes were often deployed in companies that had to keep books, had to keep ledgers, things like banks and large companies and the like. But a lot of times the output of these mainframe jobs was a printout. And a lot of times the information you would get had to be processed in batches and those batches would oftentimes happen overnight. So you might not know what your sales were for the quarter or what your profit was for the quarter until a series of jobs ran over a series of days. And I remember my first job at a Fortune 500 company downtown Cincinnati uh, out of college. That was a major mission they had is it took, uh, I, I forget the number, but something like 27 days after the end of the quarter to see how much money they made because of this whole series of calculations that would happen one night after another. These computations weren't always real time and weren't always based on the latest information because many times it was reading a file that maybe was deposited the day before and had information in it, that information might have changed. So mainframe, a lot of times it's exchanging information in flat files. I kind of made a mock-up here. You might have something like, like 10 characters for unique ID and then maybe 10 characters for a genus. Uh, maybe 25 characters for a species, and then 40 characters for a description. So it's what we call a flat file because every column or every field got a predefined set of space. And you couldn't exceed that space. If you went less than the space, you just fill it in with spaces. Now, meanwhile, the advent of the PC came, and with that, the adoption of the floppy disk came as well. Now, you can certainly use floppy disk in other hardware, but PCs are what really made floppy disk part of the vernacular. So you see here a series of disks from the 8-inch disk of long ago to the 5 and a quarter disk, which is the first one I started programming with, and I remember very well, and then the 3 and a half inch floppy disk, which is probably the most common, and it's also known as the save icon for people who don't recall what a disk looks like. It's funny, when I started programming, we had floppy disks, and they literally were floppy. They could bend. Uh, and think about bending a record or bending a CD. Think of what that does to it. So they had a limited life, and they had you didn't want to put a whole lot of sensitive data on a floppy disk. It was really just meant temporarily. The three and a half inch floppies actually had a hard case, which was a first. These were very common when I was an undergrad in the 90s, 
And also my first year teaching at UC, this will give you an idea how long I've been at UC. I still to this day have a shoebox full of three and a half inch floppy disks, which was everybody turning in their homework. I put a shoebox at the front of the classroom. Everyone would come in and drop their floppy disk into it. And then I'd go home, load the floppy disk in my computer and grade the project. So that's how data transfer happened. Now, one other example I remember from this, again, from my first job, is I happen to support both the corporate real estate department and human resources. And I went down to human resources and they told me that any time an employee moved, they would get a notice in inner office mail. They would type it into their copy of the database. But real estate had a, an identical but separate database. And I asked how they kept them in sync. And the HR representative told me that when she was finished typing the information in from the inner office mail, she put the inner office mail back in the envelope and mailed it upstairs to the fifth floor where real estate was. Real estate would open the envelope and then they would type the same information into their copy of the database. So you see, naturally, that's an operational, very inefficient way to do things. And it's expensive because you're paying people to type the same thing twice. So what came about uh, around the 90s was this idea of remote procedure calls where we could have two computers connected on a network and we could really have a program running across those two computers. So one computer could make a remote procedure call to the other. It's, we could take advantage of multiple computers simultaneously, but it did require a bit of code to do that wiring up together. And also we have to think about firewall rules. There were many remote procedure call technologies in the late 90s, I remember, were very popular. Common Object Request Broker Architecture, or CORBA, was a big one because you could have a CORBA bridge across programs written in different languages. Perl to C++, for example, is pretty cool. RMI, Remote Method Invocation, was Java to Java, which was really handy. You could write a Java program and distribute it across multiple computers, something I did a couple times. Had a lot of fun with that. COM and DCOM were some Microsoft-specific interoper interoperability platforms. You don't hear much about those anymore, but nonetheless, these were common back in the 90s. After that era of core RMI, COM, and DCOM, the next thing that we saw was web services. And web services are very much, number one, XML-based. You're moving XML across the wire. Number two, they're very structured. There's something called WSDL, or Web Services Definition Language, which is an HTML document that describes the service you're about to hit. A nice thing about the structure is that it was very predictable. You knew exactly what it was going to look like. The other nice thing is it was really easy for an IDE to attach to a web service because of that structure. That being said, all of that structure did add a bit of overhead to the concept. So XML and web services, while they, while they still exist, we tend to hear more JSON and RESTful services now. So JSON, lighter weight format, RESTful services means we hit an endpoint, we get data back, and we use the HTTP actions, get, post, put, trace, options, delete, and the HTTP response codes, 200, 201, 400, 403, 404, 409, 500, so on and so forth, we tend to use that as a way to communicate. And that's a lot of what we're going to be looking at during this course. You can still do the idea of a remote procedure call, and spring remoting right now is probably one of the more common ways to do it. Or you can use a RESTful service as we use and effectively do the same thing. So interoperability over HTTP. The internet happened. And people found it around the late 90s and then realized all of the potential that we could do with this new thing called the Internet. If you were born after the Internet was well known, I'll tell you that life before the Internet was very different than it is right now. But nonetheless, one thought was, gosh, we could do this interchange a lot like I described early on where I talked about booking a trip on Expedia and then immediately seeing the flight on Delta. The internet and the network connectivity of all these computers allows for this interchange to happen. But a couple things. First of all, we want it to be standards-based because we're talking across different companies. For example, from Expedia to Delta or from Expedia to Frontier, Allegiant, United, so on and so forth. It has to put these different things together. 
And of course, they need to be publicly available or at least available through some kind of account. And then that allows us to do integration, which is where we really start to see value here. We started with an XML concept, and XML was a breath of fresh, fresh air for anyone programming prior to XML. Reason being, XML can have a schema, or in other words, a description of what it contains. One trick with XML is that you'd have an open tag, and then some content, and then a close tag. And the close tag looked a lot like the open tag, so it, it tended to ha be a little bit heavy where something called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, came out a bit later, and it's a little more lightweight. It doesn't tend to be as constrained as XML or as well-defined as XML, which can be good and bad. XML, very much structured, very much predictable. JSON, more open-ended, more flexible. Uh, you certainly can put structure on JSON, and you certainly can have flexible and open-ended XML, but that's where the two tend to fall, and there's certainly advantages and disadvantages to each. JSON really took off with the advent of mobile phones, partially because it is a slightly smaller data set on average than XML would be. And in mobile devices, you're really looking to make the most out of every resource that you have because it tends to be a resource-limited device. Here's an example of JSON. You see that we'll have an open curly and then down at the bottom a closed curly, and that essentially represents an object. And then a square bracket represents an array. And then within an array, you can either have primitive values like strings and ends and things like that, or you can have further objects as we have here. So if you take a look at these objects, you'll see that they all have the same attributes, ID, plant, genus, species, cultivar, yet they have different values. 24.9 Colrotiria paniculata, 7.23 Acer miabii. So essentially, the attributes are defined in what we could call a class structure, and then the values are assigned when we create an object from that class. Now we can structure our JSON data with a schema, and the schema says, here are the fields that we expect to see, and here are the values we anticipate for those fields. So not always required, but we can do so. There's a schema called OpenAPI, and then there's another one called JSON schema. Another good way we can communicate across different services is by using queues and or message-driven beans. And a more advanced topic now we call Kafka. With this, what we're doing is one piece of software might output something and put it on a queue. A queue can offer guaranteed delivery, which means once the item is on the queue, it will be guaranteed to deliver to the next endpoint, or if it doesn't deliver, it will at least remain on the queue in a persistent state. So if the computer loses power, the item will still be there. What's nice about this is it helps us to integrate applications that might have different loads. The example that I use a lot is uploading a photo and having it resize and watermark. That takes a lot of time, as opposed to simply processing a form with text data. So what we might do is we might upload the photo and then drop that photo's location onto a queue and then have a background process listen to that queue, go find the photo, resize it, watermark it, and then save it. And you see it can do that heavy processing separate from all of the other processing. So queues, huge for integration. And queues are something I really got to appreciate when I worked in point of sale, just watching all of the different things that happen in the back end of the point of sale and how they can notify other processes that something has happened. Example, what if promotions change? And what if we have the old promotions cached? Maybe we drop that on a queue. And when a message driven being is listening for an item on that queue, it knows to dump the cache and then rebuild the cache with the new promotion logic. Now think about that point of sale example. It might seem like a cash register is a simple calculator on top of a shoebox full of money. But in reality, think of all the integrations that have to happen. Taxes, inventory, item restrictions. Can you buy this item? Are you the right age? Is it the right time of day? Promotions, so on and so forth. And then even we can think about integrating with outside vendors as well. So all kinds of integrations happening today. Now here's the big question. What is the business case of all of this integration? Well, data is just raw facts. 
but when you take data and you integrate it together, you get information. A lot of good examples of this that we can think about, and I'll give a few that are related to horticulture as well. But think about where you can find data and think about different classifications of data. There's publicly available data, and then there's proprietary data. And do you have a source of proprietary data that gives you a competitive advantage? Can you mix that with the publicly available data to create something that's really providing value to users? Where can you find the open data? There are a lot of open data portals, uh, things like the City of Cincinnati data portal, and also one that I'll show in a bit, uh, jsonservices.com, which is where I've just registered some of the good open data sites that students have found in this class and have used in their projects. So you can come to JSON services and search for something like weather and then search. Then you'll see a list of services that provide that. Given that a lot of users are going to be looking at your application through either a web browser or a mobile device, we, we might be able to get some information from that device itself with the user's permission. Things like where are you located? And then that can help us to tailor the data that we're pulling together and integrating to provide information. Here's an interesting thought. A lot of new business concepts that have, that have come up in the last 15, 20 years or so really don't have hard assets. The value they're providing is information. Airbnb, lodging company that doesn't own any hotels. Uber and Lyft provide you a ride somewhere, but they don't own any cars. And what about GitHub? That's an interesting one. The information they're brokering is source code there. So think about how you can create a business concept just based on information. One example that I speak to a lot is the microservice concept of driver's license, where essentially you have to hit several different lookup databases before you can issue a driver's license from criminal records, court records, organ donation, so on and so forth, and also proof of insurance. Now, a lot of times I'll discuss this in class and talk about how you could integrate this all together and have a one-stop shop when someone wants to renew their driver's license. And then I'll ask the question, who really benefits from this? And someone will often say, well, the, the driver does because it's simpler. Yeah, that's true. Someone will often say, well, the state who is certifying drivers because now they have better information. That's true too. But who really, really is going to benefit financially from this? And if you wanted to make a business where you're going to have the master information record for driver's licenses, who could you pitch your idea to to try to raise money? The insurance companies. Imagine how much money revenue they do not have where, where people lie and say they do have insurance and they're eligible to drive, but they don't actually have insurance. If there was a way to close the loop on that and, and validate that people who are driving are paying for insurance, the insurance companies are the ones who would benefit. So with microservices, think about who's going to benefit and who is going to fund this project because it might not always be obvious from looking at a diagram. Now, I mentioned a couple things here. Here are a couple services that I like to go look for to find, to find some information I can integrate. So the city of Cincinnati produces open data, as do a lot of cities on the Socrata platform. Here's one that I like to use as an example a lot, which is growing degree days. Life science, that is animal and plant science, is based on a very simple formula for when certain events occur. So by events, I mean leaf out, emerge from larval stage, so on and so forth. So a lot of these life events are timed based on a very simple formula. The formula is take the high temperature of the day in Celsius, subtract from it the low temperature of the day in Celsius, and divide by two. In other words, what's the average of the high and low temperature? Not the average temperature, but the average of the high and low temperature. Then subtract from that a base. And the base is often 10. Now, do that every day and start summing it up from January 1. And from that, you can predict when certain animal and life science events are going to happen. The Ohio State University is an extension university, and they publish a calendar of growing degree days, and they'll tell you what is about to happen. Now, we're pretty late in the year at the time I'm recording this, but we could go back to, say, let's, let's go back to, well, don't want to go back that way. Let's go back to March. 
in 2020 and just get an idea where our growing degree days were right around March 18th. And so this will tell you these are things that just happened and these are things that are about to happen. So growing degree day, one piece of information. Now, what other information can we integrate with this? Maybe weather information. And then we could also look at GPS information. And before you know it, we have put together a decision support system for farmers. And what we're doing is we're saying, OK, well, the border for Scythia is about to bloom, but the white pine weevil is about to come out to adult emergence. And a weevil is essentially a pest. It's something that eats living things. And so we know that on March 18th, because it's adult emergence, this is the best time to spray for the white pine weevil. If we didn't know this, we might spray two weeks too late or two weeks too early and then have to spray again. So this is really interesting because you see, we are integrating data to make less use of pesticides and get better output from the pesticides that we do use. So information becomes a competitor to petrochemicals. If you can take that concept and you can expand it and scale it out across many, many farmers or many, many food organizations, you'll find that that impact can be significant and very much financially worthwhile, regardless of the state of the overall economy. So making money with APIs, there's a realization now that not only is integration good for businesses, but it's also good when we open the door and we let other people into the party. So as with a lot of retailers, Kroger has uh, public APIs that are available where you can do things like add to somebody's pickup order or add to someone's delivery order. Now think about that. If we go back to our JSON services, when we search for recipe, there's no shortage of public web services out there that will provide recipes for you. And so think about integrating data here. Maybe you're looking at favorite recipes. Maybe you're looking at favorite recipes that can be queried by uh, some kind of dietary restriction or dietary preference. And then when you get these recipes, you have one button that says, add this all to your Kroger pickup or your Walmart pickup or wherever you prefer to do your shopping. That's great news, not only for the person who wrote this integration app, this recipe app, but it's also great news for Kroger in this case because it's driving more business to them. And it's great news for the customer as well because it's simplifying their life. All of this achievable just through integration. So benefits, I think we've talked through these quite a bit. Extensibility, we can create a service. We can have different variations of the service. Reusability, we could use that driver's license lookup service across many different organizations, maybe uh, maybe traffic enforcement could use that database. We know the organ donors are going to use that database, so on and so forth. And then also maintainability, because instead of having one huge monolithic application to maintain, we end up maintaining a bunch of smaller applications. Through the lens of business, we know that agility, we get that benefit through our microservices because we can just put the services together as we need them. Think about online ordering or home delivery of goods. All of these things are going to require a pricing service and a promotion service. If we can extract it from a point of sale and use it in other areas, then we get more bang for a buck. So leverage our assets, write it once, reapply it. And then also standardizations and quality. We know that our RESTful services are based on some community-driven standards. So that's a look at the history of services-oriented architecture. In our next set of videos, we'll take a look at how to host your application. I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.